Hello, Rajiv. How are you? Hi, Glenn. I'm fine. How are you? Fine. Uh, I'm Glenn Lowry uh, here at Brown University, the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, which sponsors The Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv. I'm with Rajiv Seti, uh, who is professor of economics at Barnard uh, College, Columbia University, has been there for a long time, a, a widely published and a very interesting uh, scholar who's a friend of mine as well. Uh, Rajiv has a book that's not any longer new, but it's not old either. It's a year or so out from Harvard University Press, Shadows of Doubt. Uh, there's a subtitle. I don't have the book in front of me, Rajiv. Um, it's Stereotypes, Crime, and the Pursuit of Justice. Uh, it's a book about uh, stereotyping in the context of criminal justice issues. And uh, I encourage people who are interested in that subject to look at it. Anyway, Rajiv, you're joining me here at the Glenn Show. What a what are we talking about here? Uh, me? Uh, how, how, about, <laughs> yeah, yeah, how about some small topic like the arc of your career and the role of your personal life in influencing it, something like that, given that there's going to be a conference in your honor at Brown next year with a okay. bunch of people? Well, I prompted him, everybody. You should know that. I, I prompted him. <laughs> He reminds us that in May, May 15, 2020, here at Brown University, there will be a conference celebrating yours truly, your humble servants, uh, contributions to economics and to society, uh, organized by uh, my my dear friend, uh, uh, Lawrence Kotlikoff, who's uh, been a conversation partner of mine here at Blogging Heads, the economist at Boston University, and uh, by Rajiv himself, uh, who put together uh, a lovely... Uh, series of panels discussing my work, uh, PhD, MIT, 1976. Uh, gosh, 44 years ago, uh, soon enough, and uh, uh, been uh, uh, publishing in uh, microeconomic theory, writing books and uh, articles and essays about uh, public affairs uh, and uh participating as a, a pundit and commentator, commenter and opinion writer on the debates about race and inequality in America, this sort of thing. So, you know, I don't know why people saw fit that, uh, you know, they think there's something there to talk about. And uh, we're going to uh, reprise uh, that, that scene here uh, today. With Rajiv. Well, maybe, maybe we could start right there with the, with the 1976 dissertation and your time at MIT, because, um, I was looking up your citations. You've got a lot of citations, obviously, for a whole bunch of different papers. But actually, as far as I could tell, the most cited paper is this 1977 piece, uh, Dynamic Theory of Racial Income Differences, which was a chapter in your dissertation. And uh, seems to have grown out of a conference in 1975, if I'm not mistaken, while you were still a graduate student, uh, is that is that right? Uh, it might be. That, that is correct. The paper is called uh, "A Dynamic Theory of Racial Income Differences." Uh, it's published in a conference volume edited by uh, the late uh, Phyllis Ann Wallace, a professor of management at the Sloan School of Management at MIT, a PhD economist from Yale University, an African American woman, as it happens, an expert on labor relations uh, matters. Uh, who had a long and industrious career working first in the U.S. government uh, with the CIA uh, and then uh, was the chief economist at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the 1960s when it first started out. Uh, she was influential in the careers of uh, eminent economists like Orly Ashenfelter uh, and James Heckman, who got some of the early data that they used to analyze race and labor market inequality out of the um, out of the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which was surveying American firms and asking them questions about race and employment. Uh, so Phyllis uh, came to MIT, uh, I think, the year before I arrived there, 1971, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And I uh, had a, a career there as an academic economist uh, in the Sloan School of Management and befriended me as a graduate student, uh, an African-American graduate student in economics department and, and was, a, was a mentor. Anyway, yes, the conference volume, Phyllis Wallace with the assistance of Annette Lamond. That's right. Not to forget her. 
yeah. uh, who was co-editor with Phyllis on this on this volume. And yes, uh, there had been a conference on uh, women, minorities, and employment discrimination. That's the title of this volume: Women, Minorities, and Employment Discrimination. And my chapter is, I think, chapter eight in that volume, and it's this essay. Uh, dynamic theory of racial income differences, and believe it or not, published in 1977, it continues to be cited in it the does. year it 2020, does. Yeah. 2019. It's, yeah, it's been I, cited recently. I, I think that's right, and, and it will continue to be. And I think that it, it's worth getting into the substance of the argument in that paper in a minute. But I just want to mention that, that Phyllis Wallace actually has been discussed a bit recently on Twitter Oh, really? Uh, uh, yeah, by a French economist, uh, Cléo chassonnery Zagouche. I hope I pronounced that right, you know, whose uh, part of her work is in the history of economic thought. And she describes her as one of the hidden figures who, whom we don't hear about much, but, but um, uh, actually did some of the things that you've just outlined. Um, so, so this French economist has been trying to actually publicize some of, some of her contributions because she feels that she's... Uh, She's been overlooked <laughs> to some extent in the history of thought and the history of MIT and so on and so forth. Well, that is a delight to know. I'm yeah. very happy to know that. <laughs> Phyllis Ann Wallace, uh, an African-American woman from a distinguished African-American family in Baltimore. They had been free persons of color before the emancipation, her ancestors. Uh, she is a graduate of Yale uh, PhD program in economics, the first African-American woman to get a PhD in economics from Yale, and I believe probably from any uh, place, although I can't be certain about that, yeah. the year would have been probably about 1950 when mm-hmm. she earned her degree at Yale. Um, and, uh, yes, I mean, she had a, a very distinguished career. She worked closely with Kenneth Clark. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kenneth the Clark, psychologist? The great psychologist, the one who's, uh, known uh, best, I suppose, for the research that he did that uh, lay in the background of the uh, Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Topeka, Kansas Board of Education. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that famous Supreme Court case, the Brown decision, the court held that uh, uh, segregation, uh, racial separation was inherently unequal and inconsistent with the Constitution. And uh, Clark had provided uh, in research with his wife, Mamie, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, both psychologists, had provided evidence supporting the court's argument that black people were injured intrinsically by the fact of racial segregation, the so-called doll experiment, the famous yes. experiment where kids were asked to choose between dolls of different colors, which they liked more, and the black kids who had been segregated were more likely to choose the white doll, and that was taken as an indication of their lack of self-regard as a consequence of discrimination. Anyway, yeah. Phyllis worked with Kenneth Clark uh, in New York City at the Metropolitan Applied, Metropolitan Applied Research Center, MARC, M-A-R-C. Mm-hmm. This was a, a very vital uh, research institution in New York City in the 1960s, right at the height of the Great Society, the War on Poverty, the model cities, uh, and all of this kind of thing that was going on. They were doing on-the-ground empirical research on poverty in, um, in uh, America. Uh, Clark's book, Dark Ghetto, uh, is based in part on the uh, empirical research that was being done at that time. And Phyllis was right there. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yes, she's, she's worth remembering, a hidden figure indeed. Although, you know, if you get to be professor of management at the Sloan School, you're not so hidden after all, but she should be remembered. That's for she sure. should be. She should be. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, if we can talk a little bit about your work, uh, you know, that went into this paper, and that's been a thread really in your research for for a couple of decades after that, and still ongoing, I think. And you've you've described it uh, as you mentioned earlier. There's a conference in your honor, but there have also been recent conferences in honor of uh, William Julius Wilson and Robert Putnam, and you've given several invited lectures uh, at various places, and you've re- sort of revisited these themes and sort of summarized in a, in a very short, uh, uh, interesting phrase what, what I think is one of the contributions in this paper, um, which is um, relations before transactions. Is that, is, that, is that right? Are you trying to capture 
through that phrase the the essential contribution in this paper and what what would you mean by relations before transactions okay yeah it is right it this is somewhat anachronistic in that the formulation relations before transactions is a latter day formulation yeah. something i've come up with in recent years uh but it is a shorthand way of trying to encapsulate the heart of the argument that i was making and have been making for a long time going all the way back to that dissertation and to this paper a dynamic theory of racial income differences that you're referring to i sh- i should preface this by saying it's controversial and i'm already you know anticipating the rebuttal from some people that might come but let me let me convey the idea um so african american uh economic history might be um summarized this is this is a violent reduction but not without its value i think in terms of thinking about before and after okay so before and after emancipation uh okay before and after the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century so emancipation is a transition of african american people from a uh, status of uh, property and enslavement to a status of a quote unquote free citizenry although without full citizenship rights and the civil rights movement of mid 20th century is a transformation from a subordinated uh uh minority that is uh titularly uh equal participant in the uh, civic enterprise but as a matter of fact uh especially in the south excluded and marginalized um and they get uh we get uh the opportunity uh expanded to a more equal citizenship that could be debate about how much more equal but in any case so you have these transitions and the question is what's the consequence of the liberalization of the environment for the ongoing status of african americans should we expect some kind of process to lead to equality even in the very long run does the uh, his- history of exploitation cast a, a shadow that uh, obscures and impedes uh, uh the acquisition of the benefits of american citizenship and participation in the society at least equal benefits to african americans and what shape does that impediment take uh you know the, the issue of discrimination is forefront it was forefront in phyllis wallace's work she was mm-hmm. at the equal employment opportunity commission that commission a federal agency was charged with overseeing the federal law that uh, prohibited employment discrimination on the basis of race uh, and they endeavored to do that uh, and the abrogation the ex- extirpation the elimination of discriminatory treatment this was one goal this was an ideal of the civil rights act of 1964 this was something long sought by african americans when they formed the NAAC with p when we formed with allies the NAACP uh in the early decades of the 20th century going on through the court cases and so on fighting against discrimination so a sense that if you win that fight the question is do african americans then expect is it a plausible anticipation that the gaps of uh the acquisition of property of the uh, participation in the professions of the uh enjoyment of as i say the benefits and uh uh so on of uh of prosperity within the uh, american uh context uh should we expect those to to uh to appear or when should we expect them to appear or can we even over the longest term expect that they would uh be realized equality can we get to equality if we if we cure the problem of discrimination so i tried to think about that problem and i had what might pass for an insight it led me to coin this term social capital because i wanted to think about the fact that exclusion was not merely uh, the 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 stigma the marginalization the second class status of african americans was not merely and perhaps even mainly manifest in the form of um transactional discrimination i have the skill but you won't employ me or pay me an equal wage 
I seek to purchase the property, but you won't sell it to me because I'm the wrong color. I want to live in this neighborhood, but I'm forbarred from doing so. I want to patronize this establishment, a hotel or a restaurant or a club. I'm not welcome there because of my color. Um, the uh, uh, nature of African-American subordination, it occurred to me, was partly that, transactional discrimination in the marketplace, not being able to trade on equal terms. This was the framing of the problem of discrimination, of economic discrimination that one associates with Gary Becker, uh, the late great economist Gary Becker of the University of Chicago, his book, The Economics of Discrimination, uh, you know it, of course, which was uh, very influential for decades after its publication in the mid-1950s, shaping the way that economists thought about accounting for racial economic inequality. And the idea was that employers just would not be willing to pay uh, black workers on the same terms as whites, given their skills, because of an intrinsic antipathy for association with blacks for which they would have to be compensated if they were willing to employ blacks. And that compensation took the form of less remunerative compensation to the black worker uh, to partly uh, offset the loss that the employer, the psychic loss that the employer would experience. I go on too long about this, but that had been the framework. Discrimination was not being willing to loan money to African-Americans on the same terms, refusing the loan application or charging a higher interest rate. Discrimination was not being willing to sell an automobile to African-Americans on the same terms, refusing to trade altogether or offering a higher price for the car when the person goes to the dealership. Likewise for rental property, likewise for ownership of uh, real estate, uh, likewise for participation in the professions. Uh, black lawyers, equally skilled, could not expect to be hired by the black lawyer. That was formal discrimination, okay. I wanted to go beyond that. I thought, yes, that is an issue, but it's not the only issue because there's also social discrimination. There is exclusive association. Uh, there is racially uh, structured networks of social interaction. Who invites whom to dinner? Who befriends whom? Who knows where another job is opening up because they've been told by someone that it is opening up? Who are the influences, psychic influence, social influence? Who are the peers that are connected with and are sharing their experiences with an individual, helping to um, inspire or to discourage that individual from the pursuit of this or that reward. Social connectivity, uh, I thought, was also important. And I thought that to the extent that the economic sphere, the formal economic sphere, might be freed from discrimination, if the social sphere were not, if racial discriminatory patterns of social affiliation were to continue, even though racially discriminatory patterns of formal economic transactions were to be uh, extirpated, one still might find that the inequality generated by history persisted into the future. Right. Uh, so let, let me pause because I've been talking yeah. for a long time. Yeah. No, no, no. That's, that's, that's very useful. But so let me try to rephrase what you said, you know, using a different sort of language that you yourself used uh, in your Du Bois lectures uh, uh, much later. There, you, di you distinguish between discrimination in contract and discrimination in contact. And one way to describe what you achieved in that 77 paper, or at least the question you posed and partially answered, which, you know, which you have then subsequently answered through sequence of other papers, including one that we wrote jointly together. Indeed. But the, the, the idea was this. You, you, you posed a theoretical question. What if, what if we completely were able to eliminate discrimination in contract in the lending markets and housing markets and so on and so forth, exactly as you have described? Yes. Would that then yeah. mean, would that then mean that the level playing field in the space of formal transactions would result in eventual convergence of income, wealth, and so on across groups? Or would the historical, uh, 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 you know, the, the legacy of, you know, explicitly hierarchical institutions cast its shadow into the indefinite future? And the answer you gave was, well, it depends 
on whether or not you have ongoing discrimination in contact rather than contract, which would be in the social sphere with regard to dating, with regard to adoption, with regard to marriage, with regard to friendship, you know, uh, and, and that to me seems uh, uh, like a hugely, you know, hugely important insight. And, and so would you agree with that form, formulation that, that that's the essential contribution of that, that work uh, in your dissertation and in that paper and beyond? Yeah, yes, I would agree with that. Uh, the distinction between discrimination and contract, by which I mean contract, formal economic interaction, buying, selling, working, renting, borrowing, and so on, or discrimination and contact, by which I mean informal social affiliation, being a neighbor, a friend, a partner, uh, whether in marriage or in business, uh, but uh, the question of who do I want to connect to, those connections are endogenous. They're being decided upon by people, and they may make those decisions in part in terms of the race of the others with whom they might or might not affiliate. And, yes, so I want to discrimin- distinguish between discrimination and contract and contact. And, yes, my overarching question was, if we eliminate formal discrimination and contract, should we expect equality, even in the very long run? Right. And, yes. The answer that I was able to give to that question through uh, economic theoretic modeling of the situation, I imagine an idealized formal representation of the situation. And yes, we did uh, collaborate on a paper that extended those uh, ideas. Uh, The answer I was able to give uh, to that is, well, it depends. Uh, You might expect equality to come about if the, discrimination in contact is not so great Mm -hmm. so long as you eliminate the discrimination in contract. But if the discrimination in contact, the social discrimination, the lack of social capital is so great that the disadvantaged group is relatively isolated in terms of social affiliation from the advantaged group, then you might find that the consequence of the historic denial of contractual equality would persist into the indefinite future, even mm-hmm. if you remove the contractual impediment. So, so that was the idea. Yeah. So can we talk about the policy implications that flow from this? Because it's, it's quite easy mm-hmm. to agree on the, you know, uh, uh, on the fact that discrimination in contract is, uh, is unethical. It's wrong that we ought to uh, pass laws and enforce laws that, that, that prevent it. But it's much harder, uh, you know, if, if, if um, as you put it in another paper, if equal opportunity in the formal sphere is not enough. Uh, you, you had a paper entitled, Is Equal Opportunity Enough? If equal opportunity in the, in the space of... To which my answer was no. To which answer is no. And, and if the answer to that is no, um, even if one were to vigorously enforce anti-discrimination laws in contractual relations, if you you know if the possibility existed for perpetual inequality across groups over time as a result of the historical legacy of hierarchical social organization, then what policy implications flow from it? Because regulating discrimination in contact is generally anathema to most people, uh, uh, and 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 yeah, and to us, I'm sure, it's very hard to imagine policies that would fear with people's decisions regarding such matters as, you know, dating and marriage and adoption and, 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 and uh, friendship. Um, so then what is one to do? What, what policy implications would then flow from that analysis? Well, that's a, uh, it's a very fair question. You think of some, one thinks of some things right away, but they're not all, all uh, uh, especially palatable. Um, you think about forced integration, where the government gets in the business of ensuring that social affiliations are more racially diverse than they otherwise would be as a consequence of the unimpeded and unregulated decisions of individuals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, school desegregation and school integration and busing and uh, drawing district lines so as to achieve uh, racial balance inside of schools is one manifestation of that kind of way of thinking. 
Uh, there are others. You might try to encourage racially integrated neighborhoods by impeding the processes of dynamic, uh, you know, uh, separation uh, tipping uh, that are uh, uh, mutual. We both admire very greatly the the legacy of Thomas Schelling, the great economist who pioneered formal analysis of this kind of dynamic segregation process uh, tipping. Uh, I might just mention that you have in the 2004 Journal of Political Economy an outstanding paper on that very question of inequality and segregation in housing markets. But you might try to do something about that. Yeah. Um, Tom once told me about this uh, um, idea that I thought was just this beautiful idea, which is if uh, the whites in the neighborhood think that blacks moving in are going to cause the neighborhood to run down, what they're mainly concerned about is the loss of their uh, uh, of the equity that they have in their homes, the decline of their housing value. Uh, and so they move. But if all the whites in the neighborhood uh, flee on the uh, first o- occasion of a black moving in, the decline in property value might be to some degree a self-fulfilling prophecy as the neighborhood completely changes and mm-hmm. you don't any longer have a, you know, diverse but uh, racially integrated neighborhood. You have a black, quote, ghetto. So now how can you stop that? Well, one way you can do that, uh, it's a little bit like a bank run, you know. Uh, everybody is leaving because they don't want to be the last person to go. If you wait, and you're the last person to go, you suffer the hit of the devaluation of the property. Um, But if no one leaves, no one needs to leave. So if you can guarantee people that no matter what happens, uh, they are going to be held harmless against the possibility of losing equity value in their homes, this is an insurance policy. This is like deposit insurance. You tell someone no matter what happens, the government stands behind your uh, bank account, the FDIC, uh, they, mm-hmm. you don't have to run to the bank to draw your money out when you think the bank might be shaky. And likewise, you don't have to rush to sell your house if you think the neighborhood might go bad. If someone is guaranteeing you that. But of course, if people believe the guarantee and they don't move, the neighborhood doesn't go bad and there's no reason to uh, pay out from the insurance policy. So there's a kind of uh, a brilliance in, uh, in this idea. So one thinks about things like that. Yeah, actually, I want to say something here, uh, Rajiv, because I mentioned earlier that my ideas in that paper are controversial. And I know some of my uh, fellow economists worried about racial inequality. I think of William Darity uh, at Duke University, Sandy Darity, for example, but he's not the only one would chafe a bit at this characterization. So so what am I saying? I'm saying, all right, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and what followed it in terms of anti-discrimination law has been more or less effective, and yet racial differences continue. Well, why? Because social capital is unequal. Well, with what consequence? Because the disparity of social opportunity impedes the acquisition of skill. Oh, I see. It's the supply side of the labor market, not the demand side of the labor market that you're focusing on, my critics might say. Mm -hmm. I know about white supremacy, but you're you're, you're flirting with the idea of black inferiority. You're, you're saying that they don't read as well. You're saying that they're not as uh, uh, well socialized so that their behavior is more disruptive and uh, they're more likely to participate in lawbreaking. You're saying that they haven't acquired the skills, uh, you know, the, the mastery over the social skills as well as the cognitive skills that are necessary to function well in American society. Now, you're saying that that's because the developmental process has been biased against them due to um, – a uh, discrimination in contact, and that is what I was saying. Mm-hmm. My model was a developmentally focused model. It said that on the supply side of the labor market, the skills that people bring depends upon the connections that they have. And if there's racial inequality and there's racial bias in the process of connecting people to other people, the skill opportunity, at the opportunity to acquire skills is going to be uh, impeded for African Americans. And they are going to, as a matter of fact, be less valuable contributors to the labor market so that even if you ensure that they are remunerated in terms that are comparable to their productivity, they're still going to be unequal. And a lot of people object to that because it's kind of puts the blame quote unquote on black people. Now I don't think of it as putting the blame on black people, but I do think of it as taking seriously that a skills disparity on the supply side of the labor market is part of the explanation for the inequality. We can say the skill disparity is itself the endogenous product of social discrimination. We can say that. 
it's not a reflection of the intrinsic endowment of the people who are uh, on the short end of this, but it is nevertheless a real deficit. Yeah. And the policy implication of that is to address the deficit. I just want to finish. Yeah. Address yeah. that deficit of development rather than inveigh against a imagined discrimination in contract, which has been yeah. very much attenuated. Okay, so so let me say a couple of things uh, to that. So firstly, your argument is theoretical. It doesn't really postulate that we have an absence of discrimination in contract, simply that even if we were to achieve a complete absence, you know, we would still be stuck. We, we, we yes. still have this problem to face. Important so that's, that's, that's one point. The second point is that if one goes through carefully the nature of your argument, it is not a victim-blaming argument. Clearly, clearly it is not. It is, it is because of the, uh, uh, you know, because of the, you know, the fact that a, a, a status quo that's evolved out of a system of hierarchical organization has these long-term effects uh, through the mechanisms that you just described. It's not the fault of people whose opportunities are limited by, by white flight from neighborhoods and so on and so forth. So it's not a victim-blaming argument. Having said that, though, um, the reason why I think people, uh, um, you know, people resist uh, uh, that line of argumentation is because there are others. <laughs> there are people who simply are unconcerned with uh, with racial inequality. People who, uh, uh, who 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 do engage in victim blaming. Who basically say, "Well, you reap what you sow," and so on and so forth. The playing field is level, and uh, and you still can't compete. And your argument can be seen as a source of comfort to, 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 to those who are making that argument. Uh, you know, a lack of care in distinguishing what you're saying from those who appear to be saying something similar is, I think, part of the reason why there's pushback against this argument, because the argument that you're making seems entirely logically sound and, in fact, quite consistent with, uh, with uh, work in, in sociology, psychology, and, 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 and other fields. Um, so... So I think that part of the pushback is that, you know, it is too easy for people who are really unconcerned about racial inequality, which is, in fact, in some sense, the opposite of your position, uh, to, to latch on to those arguments and say, look, you know, uh, um, you know to, to, to blame a community for its own absence of opportunity. Um, I think that's part, you know, I'm, maybe I'm being a sort of amateur psychologist here, but I think that's part uh, of where the resistance is coming from. No, I, I think there's more than a little uh, to what you say. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that uh, the arguments that you're making are in, in, in any sense invalid. They're, they're very important. They just probably have to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, communicated in, in their completeness, if you see what I mean, and, and, and uh, you know, with clarity, and which you have done, of course. But, but uh, uh, Well, I've tried, but... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about my own history of uh, involvement as a public intellectual on the right yeah. side of the uh, debate and about some of my colleagues. I'm, I'm thinking about Abigail and Stephen Thernstrom, the yeah. uh, writer. Stephen Thernstrom, the distinguished historian. Abigail Thernstrom, a political scientist. They um, are up in years now, and I don't know how active, but uh, were uh, very uh, widely read and influential commenters on race and inequality in the American society back in the 1980s and 90s, mm. a book called America in Black and White, uh, which was published mm -hmm. in 1997, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think One Nation was a subtitle, is it, or something? Uh, yeah, One Nation, Indivisible. Indivisible, yeah. I, I know the book, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there were many others. Uh, I'm thinking about my neoconservative friends at Commentary Magazine, Norman Podhoritz, Neil Kazadoy. Mm. I'm thinking about uh, my involvement at the New Republic back when the New Republic was a more center, even center right on some issues. Um, Oregon, uh, Martin Peretz uh, was the editor, uh, the publisher in, uh, of the magazine, and I was writing for the magazine at that time. Uh, I'm thinking about James Q. Wilson, uh, the late James Q. Wilson, a great political scientist, American political scientist, a giant uh, in his field in the 20th century uh, who died in, I think, 2014 or 2013. Um, and uh, whose book, um, uh, Thinking About Crime, 
collection of essays on criminology was very influential in uh, encouraging the uh, development of a more uh, robust regime of mass incarceration here in the United States. Um, that doesn't deserve to be an obituary for James K. Wilson. He was much more than that. But in any case, I'm thinking about these people. Uh, uh, Irving Crystal, mm-hmm. uh, the father of uh, William Crystal, who was writing at the Wall Street Journal and editing at uh, the Public Interest Magazine. Nathan Glazer, another uh, one of the figures of uh, that era. Uh, these are very different people, each from the other, but uh, they were a part of a world that I lived in uh, populated by conservatives. And then there were, you know, real conservatives. <laughs> I mean, not neoconservatives. There were mm. uh, people on the right. Uh, and uh, I, I was uh, close with many people in the Reagan administration through the 1980s. And so I'm saying all that to say, did those people really not care? I'm asking you, why, what, what do you think? Well, when I broke with them quite openly in the 1990s, I was at the American Enterprise Institute as a member of the academic advisory board <clears throat> for the uh, president, a man called Christopher DeMuth of the American Enterprise Institute. And after Dinesh D'Souza's book, The End of Racism, was published and with the support of the American Enterprise Institute um, and the uh, the president was standing behind it, um, I... I felt that I could no longer be associated with the Institute. So I stepped down. I wrote pieces in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal and other places, criticizing my former conservatives for not caring. Uh, you know, I, I guess the, the anecdote that captures this is uh, the 50th anniversary celebration of Commentary Magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the 1990s. This is at Harvard University. And Norman Pothoritz is being feted. He is the longtime editor of Commentary Magazine. He'd been there for many decades. Uh, and so the magazine was being uh, celebrated uh, for 50 years of contributing to American uh, political culture. And Pothorts gave a speech. And in the speech, he said, we're all conservatives now. There are no more neoconservatives. And I thought, oh, my, I thought of myself as a neoconservative in those years, as someone who had been mugged by reality, as a liberal who had been mugged by reality and who had revised his thinking in light of the data and in light of the failure of the more uh, sort of uh, uh, utopian uh, programmatic visions of the left. Uh, And Norman said, we're all conservatives now. There's no distinction worth noting. And I thought that the key distinction was, whereas the neoconservatives, like the conservatives, were critical of liberal social policy, wanted welfare reform, thought that law and order needed to be imposed, were less uh, uh, were dubious about the prospects of rehabilitation in prisons, uh, thought that, uh, you know, uh, federal housing programs were doomed to failure, the, the people had all the wrong incentives and so forth. Whereas we were critical of big government, liberal, interventionist policy, we still wanted to help the people. Mm-hmm. The question was how to help them. Uh, and when Norman uh, announced to the world that it was over, uh, this idea that you could be a, pers- a kind of progressive in terms of your, your um, moral sensibility vis-a-vis your obligations to others, on the one hand, but nevertheless a naysayer with respect to the particular programmatic uh, suggestions of the liberal uh, agenda, This idea that that was a position that one could hold, he was saying, was no longer valid. And I thought, well, that's my position. Where do I have to go if I can't, you know, because I darn sure want to help these people. Um, And I can remember something that William F. Buckley once said to me. I know I'm dropping names, but uh, I might as well say this. Uh, We're at this meeting. It's a private meeting. This is long ago and Bill is dead. So I don't think I break any rule by saying what he said. Um, And I'm complaining. I'm complaining about the abject circumstances of too many people of color, black people. I'm saying, look at the jails, they're overflow. I know people have broken laws, but the point is they're confined. This is becoming a way of life in these communities. I'm saying, look at the poverty rates, <coughs> look at the lack of penetration in the uh, various occupational venues, look at the educational disparities, et cetera. I'm saying, we can't give up on this. This is America's problem. And Bill Buckley says to me, a physician cannot be said to not care about a patient, a terminal patient, 
because he's decided simply to move on to the next case. Mm. Okay? This is not about my heart. This is about my head. The fact that I am not doing anything about this is because I don't know what there is to be done about this. Doesn't mean I don't care. Um, and uh, I, I was devastated by that, uh, frankly. It, it, are these my choices? I have to either adhere to a vigorous critique of liberal uh, social policy uh, and accept that there's nothing to be done uh, and, and therefore simply acquiesce, you know, uh, acclimate myself, I should say, to the reality of African-American subordination. Um, and, you know, this debate about whether or not I'm putting it on them or it's a consequence of history or whatever, it's the, it's the confession of impotence that I found yeah. very hard to take. There's right. nothing to be done. Why are we talking about this? We talk and we talk and we talk. There's nothing to be done. Let's move on. Next case. Yeah, there's a, it seems to me that, you know, there's a sort of, a, there's a fundamentally sort of racist underpinning to the view that nothing can be done. It's, it's, it's really, <clears throat> one can't throw up our hands if one sees everybody as, you know, sharing a common humanity with the same potential, given the same opportunities and, and so on. That's, that's, uh, to me, you know, I, I find that quite appalling. Um, you know, even if one, you know, even if one agrees that the balance of the problem lies in discrimination in contact rather than contract, uh, and, and, and the difficulties of addressing that with policies are greater than, than the difficulties of addressing discrimination in formal relations, just the idea that one, one needs to accept this reality, I just find really quite appalling. Um, but since you mentioned James Q. Wilson and you mentioned uh, incarceration, maybe we could talk a little bit about that because you addressed this. You've addressed this issue for many, many years now, going back to before even your Tanner lectures at Stanford, um, your your book on race, incarceration, American values. And, and I, I'd like to just link this to your discussion of, of racial stigma in, uh, in the Du Bois lectures, uh, because you argued there, if I'm not mistaken, that really to understand what's going on in American society and maybe in, in most divided societies of this kind, South Africa or India, um, you need to look beyond stereotypes, simply sort of dispassionate beliefs about what a person, uh, um, you know, um, wants or, or believes to stigma, which is really about uh, moral worth and about, uh, you know, uh, you know, people's, sort of a belief in, you know, a, a, a belief that, uh, you know, people are not fundamentally the same as oneself. Um, you can define stigma um, better than better than me, but you link this to mass incarceration. And one thing that I've been watching recently that I found quite interesting is the issue of uh, felony disenfranchisement. So many, many states yeah. here... Uh, in the U.S. Um, have been moving back and forth, you know, as administrations change. You know, we've had Louisiana, we've had Kentucky, you know, moving back and forth where, where, where you've got a push to, 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 to strip people of rights when they enter the criminal justice system and possibly even, you know, uh, uh, maintain that situation after they exit from prison. Um, to the other, you know, to, to, to the other, uh, uh, push, the push in the other direction, which is sort of arguing that people have rights and that even people who are incarcerated ought to have the right to vote. And this is actually Bernie Sanders' position, which is that, you know, there's no reason why if you're an American citizen, you should ever lose the right to vote. And one interesting sort of twist in this debate is, uh, is that two states, uh, Maine and Vermont, actually allow people to vote or, you know, there, there's nothing that they can do that loses them the right to vote. Now, like most states in the U.S., the, the incarcerated population in Maine and Vermont is, is disproportionately black and Latino. Uh, whites are underrepresented in, in, in prison. But the, the population of these states is so overwhelmingly white that about 80 to 90 percent, I think it's maybe 82 percent in Vermont and 88 percent in Maine. That's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's at least roughly correct of the incarcerated population in these states is actually white. And these folks have rights. They have a right to vote. And one, I mean, it's a very small sample, but one way to think about, well, why is it that, that, that murderers 
in Maine and Vermont can vote while they're incarcerated, maybe even life sentences, maybe in death row. And, uh, uh, and people with petty crimes, you know, uh, uh, fraud or larceny in, in, in other states uh, um, are stripped of their right to vote and perhaps stripped of their right to vote even after they serve their time. Yeah. And, and one possible explanation is that the, the felons in Maine and Vermont are not stigmatized in the same way. Yeah. And that, and this is part of the reason why, uh, why we have mass incarceration in the United States, that the racial character and the scale are tightly linked to each other. Um, this is an argument I think you have made uh, in, an, in Anatomy and, uh, and elsewhere. I mean, would you, would you expand on that? Have I described well, it? Accurately? No, you have, you have described it uh, aptly. Um, and and uh, I, would, I would add a couple of things. I mean, basically, the argument is... If the typical voter, the median voter, can say to himself or herself, there but for the grace of God go I, Mm -hmm. or my husband or my son or my daughter or someone like me, someone I care about, that's a circumstance. Whatever the circumstance might be, the person is drug addicted, the person has broken the law, the person is a, a domestic abuser, the person has committed a heinous offense, but it's still possible to say about that person In some sense, I can identify with their situation. I can see that happening. That could happen to someone like me. Right. To that extent, there will be a tempering of the of the hard edge of social judgment and punishment. There will be more empathy. Um, Mm -hmm. And to the extent, on the other hand, that the uh, bad outcome that is being endured by, say, an African American felon. Um, or a a teenage mother with two or three children before her 20th birthday, Um, or a drug addict who is menacing and homeless and uh, uh, vagrant, Uh, to the extent that one can say about such person that it it couldn't be me, that that's them, that that's some expression of some deviance that is foreign to me, that is alien. Uh, to that extent, it becomes possible to do just about anything with that person, to corral them, to cage them, to uh, uh, to civically excommunicate them. I mean, mm. why should the commission of a crime prevent one from participating in the civic uh, ritual of uh, of political process? Uh, the 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 deprivation of liberty need not extend to. Uh, you know, uh, uh, canceling this person as a effective citizen, which is the consequence of taking away their right to vote. Um, if indeed the massive numbers of people in prison were seen by the typical voter as being persons like themselves, you might think the typical voter would not encourage their politicians or put up with politicians who wanted to uh, 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 civically excommunicate those people. So, so yes, I, I, I do think something like that is at play. I mean, how does one demonstrate this? How would you prove it quantitatively? You have the states of Maine and Vermont, I think you said, yes, who are allowing felons to cast ballots while behind bars. Absolutely. You observe that their populations are more white than the country as a whole, and you observe that their practice with respect to allowing felons to vote is different. The question is whether the latter is a consequence of the former, and it's very hard to know. Yeah, it's a small sample, but the prosecutors, at least in Maine, are very uh, vocal in defending that practice, um, you know, and, and they believe that it is, uh, it's an important component of rehabilitation for people, you know, to, to maintain yeah. their rights while in prison. And it, I keep it, an open mind sense. about that. I need to be persuaded, but I can see how it might yeah. be true. Yeah, it might yeah. be true that exercising the privileges of citizenship and the duties. I mean, voting is not only a opportunity, right. it's also a responsibility. Right. right. Uh, uh, so, so Glenn, I know we have limited time, but I, I know that you have a memoir that is in progress. Is that right? I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, we could talk about it. It's I don't I don't like to talk about it too much because I've talked okay. about it here at Blogging Heads. The years have gone by. I've yet to write oh, this memoir. People in the comments section are saying, I know why he's right, not writing the memoir. The guy screwed up. He can't come to terms with the contradictions of his own position, and therefore he's not writing the memoir. So, so um, I'm, I'm okay. going to say a couple of things. The first thing I'm going to say is, 
Yeah. I'm going to finish the memoir before the summer is out. That's the first thing I'm going to say. I'm going to hold you to that because yeah, I, I want, to, yeah, I want to. to read it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've, I've made great progress. I have, but, it, but it's not yet, uh, not quite yet ready to show. Well, there are fascinating bits and pieces, right? That you yeah, have I've, I've added a little bit of lectures here. and you, yeah. And, and it's, uh, it's something that's going to be really worth reading and it actually, um, it helps to understand your 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 interest in the issues uh, that you've explored throughout your career as well. I mean, um, so let me ask you this. So if we let's not talk about the memoir, but let me ask you, what was the reaction at MIT? Uh, I know you worked with Bob Solo um, and 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 others to to the to the fact that you know you you took an interest in researching these questions so so of course you also had other papers in your dissertation you had the econometrica paper which was not uh, uh, specifically about group identity at all it was just yes. generational transmission of learnings but what was the reaction were you encouraged discouraged were you frowned upon were you were you cheered um, on gosh um i was encouraged mit 1972 to 1976 gosh it's a lifetime ago yeah. Um, it was just the most wonderful experience uh, for me uh, intellectually. Um, you know, we live now, we're immersed in this heavy, heavy emphasis on race. And it's true that I was a black kid from the south side of Chicago coming to MIT in the early 1970s with the civil rights movement still, still echoing in the background. It was already, it had peaked, but there was still a sense of, excitement and, and so many people were hopeful <coughs> the urban disturbances the riots of the 1960s the Kerner commission's report and all of that uh was in the very recent past um all of my teachers almost all of them all of my influential uh, professors at MIT were liberal to one degree or another okay maybe with a couple of possible exceptions but i'm not going to name their names because it'll seem snarky <laughs> Um, but but they all were were progressively oriented. Uh, Bob Solo was Paul Samuelson, although aloof, uh, very hard to know Paul Samuelson. But uh, certainly his heart was in the right place. If you read his columns in Newsweek magazine or you saw what he put in his textbook and whatnot, uh, he was a Keynesian liberal uh, Democrat uh, conventional orientation. Uh, uh, Franco De Modigliani, the Italian, brilliant Italian uh, macroeconomist, also a very decent man and a man of the soft left. Uh, Marty Weitzman, uh, uh, the people who are influenced me, uh, Stanley Fisher, uh, and others. Um, and, and they were all encouraging. They were encouraging. Now, it should be mentioned that I did theory at MIT. That was, that was my yeah. field. Uh, and so it was all about technical stuff, hard, the hard stuff, you know, getting into the guts of the mathematical modeling of things. And this is before the data revolution. This is before laptop computers. This is before everybody could envision launching a research project by hiring a firm to conduct a survey or doing a cleverly designed experiment with their students and engendering a bunch of data on their desktop and then massaging it into graphs and equations and tables and putting it out as an empirical piece. A lot of the work had to happen up here and with your paper and your pad, your pen and your pad as you scratch through the, the equations and tried to make some sense of it. So conceptual modeling was a very, very big part of my uh, understanding of what economics was about. Of course, it was an empirical subject. Of course, one wanted to attend to the facts and to the evidence. But a lot of emphasis was put on modeling, and that's what I was. I was a modeler. I was an applied economic theorist. I was an opportunistic uh, problem solver who would go from the field of labor economics to uh, finance to industrial organization to uh, urban economics to whatever it might be and try to identify problems that one could then develop formal arguments about and use one's virtuosity with respect to mathematical analysis to illuminate uh, the interaction between different elements of these various problems. Um, I was good at that, and I was encouraged in it uh, by my advisor, Robert Solo, who was himself a master of this particular art, um, and by Peter Diamond, who was the second reader. I should not have uh, neglected to mention him uh, earlier, a Nobel laureate, and, and uh, had a big influence on me uh, during my graduate school days. 
uh, and Stanley Fisher was the third uh, person on my on my dissertation. Actually, I'll tell you a story. When yeah. I first got to MIT, I didn't think any of the white, and by the way, they were all Jewish. <laughs> I mean, almost maybe even literally everybody whom I've mentioned here so far is Jewish. Um, well, part, that's part of the story of the rise of MIT, isn't it? Because the yes. anti- anti-Semitism at Princeton and Harvard. Indeed. Uh, and Paul Samuelson is this uh, brilliant and extremely productive, prolific genius of an economist in the uh, late 1930s and early 1940s. He's studying at Harvard. And when he completes his studies, World War II is ongoing. So he works in the government and whatnot. But at the end of the war, he comes to begin a career. He's only 30 years old or something like that. He comes to begin a career in economics and he can't get a chair at Harvard, even though uh, his dissertation, which became the foundations of economic analysis is a watershed breakthrough treatise Mm -hmm. on formal economic analysis, which ought to have earned anybody a chair at any uh, institution. Harvard would not appoint him appropriately. So he moved down the river to MIT and started the department. (laughs) <laughs> so, yes, it, it, it does owe its genesis to anti-Semitism. But these liberal Jews wanted to do the right thing. So they had affirmative action at, at uh, MIT, and they were bringing African-Americans to study there, and I was one of them. Um, I had a very strong record as an undergraduate student at Northwestern University. I probably could have been admitted to MIT with or without affirmative action, but that's neither here nor there. MIT was... Uh, uh, the economics department was determined to be on the right side of history with respect to the question of training young people to pursue the profession in the United States of America, which had serious racial problems. Uh, there were many, uh, Lester Thoreau is another person, Michael Puri is another person, mm-hmm. uh, Jerome Rothenberg is another person, all of whom were interested in my work. Uh, they weren't on my committee, but they wanted, they came to the seminars where I was presenting. Uh, They encouraged me. They invited me to come around to their offices and stuff like that to talk about economics and talk about the work that I was doing in economics. So um, I got I got tremendous encouragement. But I was going to tell the story of when I first got there. I didn't know this. I didn't know that I was going to meet with a congenial environment. I was alienated and and to a certain extent prepared to be on the outs. Uh, I ended up finding a terrific home of uh, of uh, fellowship with my fellow students and of mentorship uh, with the faculty, but I wasn't sure about this. And so the summer before I started my studies in 1972 at MIT, I sat down and I wrote a long letter to David Blackwell. Oh, David Blackwell, the late David Blackwell is a great statistician, a towering figure in American statistical scholarship at mid 20th century. Really uh, one of the, you know, one yeah, of the, yeah. one of the uh, most uh, uh, statistical and, decision theory, dynamic programming. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know. I mean, uh, um, every graduate student, you know, learns about Blackwell when they're when they're doing the introductory courses in in, in macro and math methods with, uh, 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 you know, when they when they're learning about dynamic programming and contractions and you know Blackwell right. conditions. But but was he at Berkeley at that time or Howard? He was at Berkeley. I didn't know him from a hole in the ground. Marcus Alexis had told me about him. Marcus Alexis, uh, the late Marcus Alexis, gosh, all these people are dead, <laughs> was a uh, African-American economist and was a mentor of mine at Northwestern University when I was an undergraduate and a friend of mine after I finished my doctoral uh, training and came back to Northwestern as an assistant professor. Marcus was chairman of the department there, and he was an influential person in my uh, early academic career, Marcus Alexis. He's black uh, from the West Indies, actually. Um, uh, his family is from the West Indies, uh, but he grew up in New York. But in any case, Marcus uh, told me, he said, you know, you ought to follow the work of David Blackwell. You ought to know who David Blackwell is. He told me this is an undergraduate because I was a mathematics major at Northwestern. I was doing very well, taking graduate courses and mathematical analysis with the Ph.D. students, even while I was an undergraduate at Northwestern and doing well in those courses. Um, and thought about a career in, in mathematics for a while and, until I found out that I wasn't nearly as good at mathematics as I needed to be in order to stand out in, in the competitive environment of academic mathematics. But in any case, Marcus said, you ought to know about David Blackwell. So I went into the library, and I looked. Yeah. Yeah. And my God, I looked. And here was David Blackwell 
uh, with a contract from the Office of Naval Research in the late 1940s where Kenneth Arrow was his colleague, and they yeah. were writing papers on convexity and infinite dimensional spaces and supporting hyperplane theorems and, you know, the kind of, you know, uh, stuff that I was coming to love as a student of economic theory. And I had no idea that a black person was contributing uh, to this work. And then there was this a great paper, I think 1953, on discounted dynamic programming. Yeah. Uh, and then there was this paper on the uh, comparison of experiments, equivalent comparison of experiments, okay. which is a okay. profound uh, in, uh, paper. Uh, we could go into details, but no one would understand what we were talking no, but about. Actually, a very active area of research right now in theory. Uh, um, oh, you're talking about Bayesian uh, persuasion? Bayesian persuasion, exactly. That, that, exactly. You know, that, that references insights. Uh, and, uh, yeah, there's also the earlier work uh, by Kalai and Samet on merging of opinions. I mean, Blackwell is all over economics. I mean, you know, he's... he's, he's so so he's, I wrote to him out of the blue. Yeah. I said, yeah. I'm an African-American. I'm about to go off to MIT to study. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have the proper mentors there. Uh, can you help me? <laughs> May yeah. I, can I communicate with you from time? He was very gracious. He replied, of course, you could communicate with me. I'll be helpful to the extent that I can, but please don't have high hopes because I'm not an <laughs> economist. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I wonder how many letters a prominent black scientist in the 1950s would have been getting uh, from younger blacks yeah. who were reaching out to try to find a role model somewhere. I never met David Blackwell. But he always loomed large in my mind as a um, inspiration, as an inspiring figure, and someone that I at least theoretically had on tap to seek out. Turned out I didn't need David Blackwell's uh, advice because I had Robert Solo's advice, which was yeah, pretty good advice. Well, Blackwell couldn't get a teaching position. He went to uh, he was a student of Duke, I believe, at the University of Illinois. Went to the Institute for Advanced Study and then couldn't get a teaching position. Uh, uh, ended up at I uh, couldn't get a at Howard. I think he was. He ended up at Howard for many many years, and 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 despite a very heavy teaching load, produced you know these path breaking papers before he was finally hired at Berkeley. But but Blackwell's uh, Blackwell's story is yeah that could be a show in its own right. But um, so um, yeah, I don't know how much time we have left. But can can you tell me something about Marcus Alexis? Because I I went back and I looked at. This 1973 paper in the AER Papers and Proceedings about discrimination, where he, I don't know if you know this paper, where he critiques uh, Becker's approach to discrimination. Is it about power, is it? Well, it's more about, no, it's inter, I think it's discrimination with interdependent preferences. And, and, and the argument he makes is, look, if you're, if you're an owner, you know, the owners of businesses are usually uh, um, at some distance from the day-to-day -day running of a business, especially with corporations. And, uh, and the question was, well, why would an owner... Uh, uh, you know, who, who may have Becker type preferences, antipathy, care about, uh, you know, about, uh, uh, you know, about the utility of their managers and workers. I mean, they'd want the highest productivity workers. You know, how can you get discrimination if the owners are removed from the workplace, you know, which is the case of corporations. And the argument he makes is actually that they internalize the welfare of people in their own social group. So they have, they're, they're, they're altruistic towards in-group members. And, you know, this is, this is why they are supportive of uh, hiring discrimination and so on. It's an interesting argument, and I'm kind of surprised that it's not there, not very visible in the sort of in the literature on discrimination. But I got very intrigued, so I thought, you know, if we have a couple of minutes left, uh, if you could just uh, tell me about Marcus Alexis, because well, I can tell you that uh, Marcus was a wonderful human being, a very gregarious fellow. His laugh would fill. A room. Uh, he befriended me or took me under his wing, if you will, when I was an undergraduate student at Northwestern, advised me against studying at the University of Chicago. Um, I was married with two children as an undergraduate and, uh, you know, didn't want to leave the family support network that my wife and children and I had in Chicago yeah. to set off to a place that was unknown to us. Uh, that was a big challenge uh, to us. Uh, and so my inclination had been to stay in Chicago uh, and uh, to enroll in graduate school at the University of Chicago if they would have me. It turned out they would have me. Um, and Marcus counseled me against that. Uh, he was not alone in this. Yeah. Uh, thinking that it would just be a shame if the <laughs> – <laughs> potential that I represented in terms of uh, becoming a, 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 a successful economist were somehow to be undermined or tainted by the ideological cast of the 
way that economics was approached at Chicago, the sort mm-hmm. of uh, Friedman uh, Stigler esque yeah. uh, free market uh, uh, ideology that uh, you know affected and influenced everything that came out of that department. The department had a very uh, strongly defined identity in that respect. An outstanding department by any measure. They have the Nobel Prizes to attest to it, have been, have sustained themselves as a top five department for a half century or more, uh, yeah. Chicago. So there would have been nothing wrong professionally with going to the University of Chicago, but somehow they, they did seem to be in Marcus's mind and ultimately I think in my own as I came to know more about it. <coughs> Uh, he befriended me, took me into his household, befriended my wife and children. I got to know his family. When he launched the summer program for minority students in economics, which is an important part of Marcus's legacy, <clears throat> 1974, uh, he was chairman of the Committee on the Status of Minorities in the Economics Profession that the American Economics Association had in panel. And he persuaded the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations and maybe some others um, to um, to fund a summer program, an intensive academic program over the course of two weeks that would pick uh, promising young African-American juniors in college in the summer mm-hmm. after their junior year, sophomore sometimes, and um, put them through kind of a boot camp experience in economic theory, microeconomics, macroeconomics, and in statistics, so they would, A, be better prepared to compete for admission to a top flight program, have some idea of what uh, the uh, requirements of such a program were, be inspired to take seriously the possibility of a career in academic economics uh, as a person of color. Um, and so Marcus was behind that, and he invited me to work with him uh, as a colleague, a, a junior colleague. I was still in graduate school. Um, in the uh, program. So the summer of 1974, I went out to Berkeley, California. Unfortunately, my marriage had uh, broken up uh, by after two years in graduate school. Um, and I, I, I went uh, on my own uh, with my uh, estranged wife and children behind to Berkeley, California for that summer for those two weeks. And um, it was, I actually was out there for three weeks. It's a wonderful experience. And I worked with Marcus. I worked with him the next year. The same program uh, was impaneled at Northwestern University in 1975. And he and I um, uh, helped to put on that program um, and uh, continued to collaborate with Marcus. And I was, there's a, there are many things that you could say about Marcus. Uh, he was president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago oh, for I had a no number idea. of years. He was a commissioner of the Interstate Commerce Commission. Wait a minute. Let me get this right. The one that regulated trucking and railroads. Um, uh, Oh, my God. This is back in the 70s. Um, But I'm pretty sure it was the ICC. I'm pretty sure it was. But he went in the Carter administration into the government um, at a high level. Um, he uh, chaired the economics department at uh, at BU. He was a prominent member of the Caucus of Black Economists and then the National Economics Association, which is the African American Economics Group, as you know. Yes. Um, um, and uh, he was a uh, a creative. Your summary of that paper of his from the American Economic Review early on. Um, I think gives some reflection. I actually don't know that paper, uh, especially I don't recall that paper, but Mm. as you, as you describe it, it sounds like he had an idea. Uh, And that was kind of uh, uh, representative of uh, Marcus's outside the box thinking Uh, you would have called him today an applied microeconomist. He worked a lot on consumer economics, (coughs) on uh, racial discrimination in uh, the marketplace and in finance and in banking, uh, things like that. Uh, again, it was before laptop computers and, uh, uh, you know, uh, regression packages and so on. It was, mm-hmm. they, these was the wild west days of early, uh, computer assisted empirical research in economics, but, uh, that's the kind of thing that he did. Mm-hmm. And he did it very well. Yeah, it's worth, uh, bringing up these folks from time to time. You know, uh, at least it got me to look at that paper. I think I'm going to go back and look at it, you know, more closely now. 
Yeah. But uh, but that's for a different conversation, I think. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I guess maybe we should uh, call this one to a close. We've got about an hour or so, uh, yeah. and, and we can uh, we can have another conversation at some subsequent date. But yeah, it's nice to get back to talking on blogging heads. It's been a while. Yeah. Oh, I got to tell you something. Yeah, uh, I'm going to speak with Danielle Allen on oh. blogging heads in February. That's great. That's great. Uh, she had a piece in the Washington Post a few weeks ago. I'm sure you saw it. Yes, I did. Uh, about uh, how uh, when she grows up, what she wants to do is get economics on the right track. Her her, her dream activity yeah. is the reformulation of economic theory. Yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, this woman is a classicist and a political theorist. Yeah. And she thinks she's going to tell me how to think about economics. What's up with that? So I read that piece and I, I saw, uh, you know, brilliant ideas in it, as you would expect to see. But I also saw what I thought was probably, uh, you know, a misreading of what uh, of what modern economics is really trying to do. I, uh, we, you and I can have a whole long conversation yeah. about this, yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk with Danielle about it. So stay tuned and then maybe we can follow up with. Uh, Absolutely. And I actually thought of Danielle when we were talking about stigma and incarceration, because what she is she did in her book, Cuz. And what uh, Brian Stevenson has been doing, you know, with Just Mercy and yeah. with the uh, Equal Justice Initiative is really the humanization of people, uh, you know, people who, you know, may have may have committed heinous crimes or who may have, you know, done things that uh, performed acts that people might consider appalling, but which, uh, uh, you know, which doesn't detract from the fact that in you know, on many dimensions they are they are as human you know they are, they are just like you and me and this is the point you were making about there but for the grace of God go I and I think that what Daniel has been doing actually on this dimension and Brian Stevenson and a few others is is really hugely important as a part of this conversation uh, about decarceration in America but that's again a topic for another day but I just thought I'd mention it since you mentioned Danielle. Okay, well, I'm going to have my homework ahead of me to get prepared yeah. for my conversation with her. She is a formidable uh, mind. Yeah, she does. Yeah, she does. All right, Rajiv. Well, this is Rajiv Seti. I'm uh, signing off with Rajiv Seti of Barnard College Economics Department, Columbia University. Uh, thanks for coming on The Glenn Show, Rajiv. Thanks, Glenn. I'm sorry I faded into the darkness. I don't have good lighting in this room, but... Uh... Okay. <laughs>